When you talk about a book that has a legacy as well known as this one, you gotta ask yourself, this many years later, is there really anything new for you to talk about? Well, you bet Jurassic there is, and we're gonna do that now. Scientists are preoccupied with accomplishment, so they are focused on whether they can do something. They never stop to ask if they should do something. They conveniently define such considerations as pointless. If they don't do it, someone else will. Discovery, they believe, is inevitable. So they just try to do it first. That's the game in science. Even pure scientific discovery is an aggressive, penetrative act. It takes big equipment and it literally changes the world afterwards. There is always some proof that scientists were there making their discoveries. And discovery is always a rape of the natural world. Always. Whatever it is you seek, you have to put in the time, the practice, the effort. You must give up a lot to get it. It has to be very important to you. And once you have attained it, it is your power. It can't be given away. It resides in you. It is literally the result of your discipline. But all major changes are like death. You can't see the other side until you're there. In the information society, nobody thinks. We expected to banish paper, but we actually banish thought. Living systems are never in equilibrium. They are inherently unstable. They may seem stable, but they're not. Everything is moving and changing. In a sense, everything is on the edge of collapse. And to the Earth, a hundred years is nothing. A million years is nothing. This planet lives and breathes on a much vaster scale. We have been residents here for the blink of an eye. If we are gone tomorrow, the Earth will not miss us. Real life isn't a series of interconnected events occurring one after another like beads strung on a necklace. Life is actually a series of encounters in which one event may change those that follow in a wholly unpredictable, even devastating way. Because the history of evolution is that life escapes all barriers. Life breaks free. Life expands to new territories, painfully, perhaps even dangerously. But life finds a way. Hey, what's up, bookworms and Crichton Critters? Mike back today to talk a little more. Michael Crichton, one of his lesser known books, uh, Jurassic Park. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's kind of a kind of a cult thing. It's not really, yeah, obviously, guys, uh, this is an important book that I think everyone has heard about by now. Even if they've just watched the movie, they know obviously that it is a very, very famous book. So good that I've got two copies of it, the, uh, the uh, Folio Society edition, which is just beautiful. And I also like this Barnes Noble edition that has it and Lost World and these nice sprayed edges on it. I tease my kids that uh, that is actual dino DNA on the uh, Folio Society edition, and they believe me. But guys, this was released in 1990. It is the seventh book under his own name. Uh, this book was a huge hit, guys, even before the movie. I know that's obviously where a lot of people found out about it. That's where I... I had read Andromeda Strain, but I couldn't have told you it was by Michael Crichton until this came out. I was like, oh yeah, he also wrote Andromeda Strain. So yeah, I just like everyone else, I went and saw that movie, immediately ran to the bookstore. It was everywhere and picked up the book and read it and fell in love with it for all different reasons than the movie, which is what we will talk about. Now, this has been sent to press over 100 times and has sold over 12 million copies. Obviously, the biggest book that Crichton ever released. He had other big hits in his time, but nothing will ever really compare to this. This is uh, something that has just been in the pop culture for 20, almost 30 years now, mostly due to that movie. And again, and within the book community well before that, I mean, then what, three years? It was three years old when that movie came out. But again, I, I don't want people thinking that this book was only popular because that movie, this book was, a, there was a reason there was a big rights battle to get the rights to make the movie, this book, because this book was super, super popular. And when you had Steven Spielberg and James Cameron fighting it out over who got to adapt this movie obviously you know how important it is but uh my top 10 that i did for this uh for michael Crichton books i had this as my number one now my biggest question going into this reread was is my opinion going to change was it all nostalgia or has it aged rather well well we're just like uh, digging up some nice little dinosaur bones we're going to talk about it here by getting into what is it about an astonishing technique for recovering and cloning dinosaur dna has been discovered now humankind's most thrilling fantasies have come true and creatures extinct for eons roam Jurassic Park with their awesome presence and profound misery. And all the world can now visit them for a price. 
But facing potential lawsuits and on a tight schedule to open the park on time, John Hammond invites scientists and paleontologists to the park in advance to give a recommendation of safety for the public until something goes wrong. And guys, I think right now, if you're the only one who don't know what Jurassic Park is about, uh, there's really not much I can say except where have you been the last 30 years, right? Let's do like tradition dictates. Let's go with what makes it good or bad. I like to start with the good. And guys, the good dinosaurs, right? I mean, I don't know how it is. Like I've always said, I can't speak for the ladies. I've only experienced it from this half of life. But for guys, ever since we are old enough to play with toys and understand anything in life, everything went back to dinosaurs. Dinosaurs were like the coolest thing. Nothing ever captured our imagination and fascination like dinosaurs, not sharks, not uh, superheroes, none of that stuff could capture our imagination quite like dinosaurs. That's why they keep putting out these Jurassic Park movies that are kind of low in quality and they still make billions around the globe and they still make so many cartoons and all that stuff because people, guys are obsessed with dinosaurs. And I'm not saying that women cannot be obsessed with dinosaurs. I've known quite a few in my lifetime, but I'm just saying I can only speak of my experience. That's why I was so interested in this story when it first came up because it had dinosaurs and when you're gonna do with dinosaurs you're gonna be dealing with uh, lots of science and we'll get to that in a second but I think that one of the best things about this book is his improved character development that I talked about in Sphere I felt like it was night and day between Congo and Sphere in the previous books uh, of how well his characters were. I felt that like something he struggled with early on, differentiating his characters, making you care about his characters. Now, it's still uh, a rather a, a matter of personal opinion. Some people still say uh, his characters, I don't really find them likable. I think that's because the way that he writes them, he writes them like real people. These aren't uh, morally white or morally dark characters. They are just regular people they're scientists usually you know as a as a, as a as a if you got stephen king always has to put writers into his stories i feel like Crichton's always got to write himself into the story as the scientist and he's very much uh the chaos theorist in this which we'll talk about but uh i i think with this uh he's not only is his characters better um i feel like he 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 does write some in particular ways it's going to get a visceral response from the reader whether you're like okay oh god i don't want nothing to happen to that character or oh my god i wish that character would get eaten you know so uh he's obviously doing a good job there i think uh differentiating his characters and making you feel something for them one way or the other where in some earlier Crichton books i can i can admit to being like if a character was going to die or something I'd be like hmm, whatever uh with this it's like yeah you you don't want to see that and you do kind of have have that thing where you're in the safety of sitting on your sofa you're gonna be like man i wish some raptor would come eat this fool right and you will do that more than one occasion while reading this book but i, I think when you talk about the science i feel like Crichton kind of pulls the double switch on you this time because you go to the book thinking this is going to be the science because i say in each one of his books he has like a specific section of science that he's going for but this one you think is going to be genetic engineering and that is very much here obviously but then he hits you with chaos theory now chaos theory is something that almost has become a meme now because of the movie but it is a very very real thing it's just basically saying that uh the, the math dictates that anything that bad can happen will happen and uh it's one of those kind of things i wouldn't necessarily say i agree with that but i'm looking at the logic behind the character and i'm like i'm finding it all really really hard to disagree with some of these things but uh yeah uh, uh, chaos theory is something that i think that you can kind of you you can go on google and start researching it and i think that's a thing about Crichton books that i always find just so fun is i'm not i'm not to the point of, like fact checking him i'm not going to fact check Crichton. he was a very very smart man he knew what he was talking about uh, i'm not going to fact check him but i start being like is this something real? Like he talks about a creature in here that was extinct for thousands of maybe more years. And then all of a sudden, poof, one day it just pops back up. And I looked this thing up to see if this was real. And it realized it was very real. I was like, that is amazing. I would have never even thought about something like that. It's like like I said in, in Sphere, where he talks about like uh, the depressurization thing, keeping us from exploding. It's like, it's just things that he brings up in his books I find so incredible because it's something I never would have considered. And I think that's just what makes his book so fun. It's because it makes science fun, you know? I don't think it's been since Mr. Wizard. You anybody remember Mr. Wizard? I know most of you guys are probably Bill Nye. I was Mr. Wizard. I'm a little older than you. But uh, that's the first time I think since then that science has been fun, is reading Crichton books. But uh, this book just has so many themes, guys. Uh, the big one, obviously, man versus nature, man versus technology, man versus power kind of thing. Uh, a lot of these uh, things, like you think of Hammond, he believes that he can control nature through technology. And it's that point where it's like, okay, but... What about if that technology if that technology fails? Like you say, well, it's not going to. But what if it does? You know, when those, when those fail safes 
are gone. How is man going to uh, to, to go against uh, against nature? And you see rather quickly, uh, he goes back to the bottom of the food chain. And he doesn't shy away from these themes in this book. And then man versus nature is one of my favorites. I mean, you go back all the way to like Lord of the Flies. That's one of my favorite kind of themes in stories like these. I, I love it. But uh, not that this is close to Lord of the Flies, but you just know what I mean, right? Then you talk about the power aspect of it. You know, engineering these dinosaur shows, hey, whoa. Your scientific power, it's, it's second to none. It can't be beaten. But again, what happens if those fail safes are removed? Hmm, you got no power left. The dinosaurs immediately take back that power once the locks are off of the doors, right? So uh, the biggest thing about this book, I think, that a lot of people don't understand is this is very much a sci-fi horror book. It is horrific. And when you think about it, you're like, yeah, that should make sense. You've got people being eaten alive in these books. You're getting things from their point of view while they're being eaten alive and it is horrific it very much is and uh he doesn't he doesn't shy away from his bloodthirst at all in this book it is very very gruesome no one is safe no matter what age they are nudge nudge wink wink uh you know what scene i'm talking about if you've read it it's it, it right off the bat man he just hits you with it and you're like wow this is this is pretty dark you know i, I a lot of the Crichton books have had a lot of you know dark themes and, and things that you need to think about but this is where it's really the first time i think it's up in your face and you can see why when james cameron wanted to buy the rights to this to make the movie he very much wanted to make it a horror movie so uh it's kind of interesting to think about what we would have gotten if that had happened but it's easy to see but guys i mean this book it's just a thrill ride from beginning to end sure there's all these themes and things that'll make you really think okay well, should man be playing god things like that it'll really make you think obviously like any Crichton book does i think he's always great at that but this is the one where it's just like dude it is just an adventure straight from go it just does not let up from the moment they get to the park there's never a part in this book where i feel like anything lulls none of it none of it, it is just a smooth smooth read you will finish it so fast uh it, it, at this point i feel like it's kind of one of his longer books up to this point but it just it's just butter man it will just whew, you will not be able to stop. It's so good. And I'm happy to say, even on a reread, uh, this was every bit as good as it was the first time I read it as a 15-year-old. But uh, everything is perfect, guys. Uh, there are some couple of things here I think people are going to kind of gripe about. Uh, these aren't necessarily things that bother me, but I think they might bother the reader. And I mean, the first one I think is if you're if you're one of those, and I got I got to word this gently, um, if you're someone who believes in humanity's effect on the planet on what mankind can do to the planet uh his character here ian malcolm is very very uh vocal against that and if that's the kind of thing that bothers you it's going to ruffle feathers a little bit this is something that he would start kind of doing and uh, up through state of fear when it really hit a boiling point with the uh, the general public and, and and journalists and critics and things like that it began really here and uh, again uh, it, to me, this is a science fiction book, guys. You know, uh, if you disagree with what he's saying in the book, it's a science fiction book, you guys. I don't think that this is like this isn't like some uh, esteemed paper that he's writing here. So uh, I'm just saying that those are things that bother you. Yeah, it's going to ruffle your feathers, but again, it doesn't ruin the story for you. Uh, probably the biggest one in this, though, Lex is super, super annoying. Just super annoying. Like the point where you just want you to like grab the page and crumble it up because she's so annoying. All these, everything is just going to shit around these characters and she's just whining and things like that. But let me tell you guys a little secret in case you don't know. Kids are annoying. They are very, very annoying. It's very accurate. Kids don't care what's going on. No matter what the stress level is, kids don't care. They're annoying and they're almost always hungry. So um, as a parent of a nine and a six year old, when I was reading this, I was like, I could see this happening. I could see us running from dinosaurs and, and, and my youngest being like, can we eat now? I'm hungry. I could see that quite a bit. So uh, it's it's one of those things that it's, if you have, don't have kids, it might it might frustrate you. And if you do have kids, you might be like, wow, I feel like I'm babysitting and not getting paid right now. Uh, you can I could see that very, very easily. So she's a very annoying character, but it's very realistic in my opinion. But you know what? She does have her moments of redemption, as all things should be. But guys, let's move into why I think that you should read it. Did you love the movie? I'm pretty sure you did. I don't think I've met very many people. I can count on one hand how many people didn't like the movie that weren't just trying to be like a hipster contrarian. It's a great, great movie, right? But if you like that movie, you're going to enjoy this book. But you must understand right off the bat, it is very, very different. There are lots of changes. There is a lot of the big moments are still the same that are in the movie. There's even some dialogue, especially uh, Dr. Malcolm's, that is straight 
from the book. Sometimes some of the dialogue uh, is from, from characters in the book is given to different characters in the movie, but it works fine. But I'm saying if you like that movie, look at this book as like the director's cut. And I think that you're going to have a blast with it, even though you got to understand it is a lot more horror than I think you might have expected if you've only seen that movie. The movie is very family friendly. This is quite, quite spooky. Now, I'm not going to say you need to be a horror enthusiast to like this. I'm just kind of setting the expectations in that. Uh, yeah, where the movie would usually, uh, like it, it, when... Like in the movie when, when the one gentleman is being killed by raptors and it's showing it and it zooms in on the raptor's eye and you hear the guy screaming. Yeah, Crichton shows you what's going on with scenes like that. I definitely think I would call this, this, this book more like a John Carpenter than a Steven Spielberg kind of presentation. And I think if you go into it with those expectations, you're going to have a great, great time with it. Now I really, I really, really want to see the John Carpenter adaptation of this movie now. But guys, this is a billion dollar franchise for a reason. There's a reason they're still making Jurassic Park movies. There's a reason they're still, you know, kid shows on Netflix. There's a reason you can't go into a Walmart and not find Under Roos with a Jurassic Park logo on it. It's because the ideas that Mr. Crichton had with this story all started right here. And you could see right away he had something really, really special. And it is aged phenomenally. One of the best books of the 90s, guys. And it isn't even close. It is very much um, probably his best book. I don't know. Let's talk about what my final thoughts. It wasn't nostalgia, guys. It was not nostalgia. This book is every bit as fantastic as it was in my memory. Probably more. There's more things that I can relate to in real life. Like I said, now that I have kids, I can understand Lex and Tim much, much better than I did at that time. Because when I read it, I was a teenager already, and I thought that all kids, you know, younger than me were annoying, you know. So I think it, it takes being a parent and saying, you know what, no matter how annoying these kids are, <laughs> the, the real, your own kids are probably more annoying, honestly. But uh, yeah, it, it, I think, but without a doubt, this is still my favorite Crichton book. And it wasn't. I wasn't a hundred pages into it where I was like, "Yeah, man, this is, this is every bit as great as I remember." And I think you're going to feel the same way. I love the the horror elements a lot, but honestly, what I always love about crime books is I love the moral questions that arises. Should man play God? Things like that always are going to be up in the front. I'm no chaos theorist at all, but again, like I said, I find it hard to argue with a lot of his points. And uh, anytime you can kind of just take a step back. And look at it and be like, yeah, even if we could do this, you know, because I always say a lot of his books, I always feel like he was ahead of the curve. You know, I was like, he would talk about stuff and five years later would happen. This still hasn't happened, obviously, but uh, it's one of those things we look at and be like, is anyone saying that it couldn't, though? You know, maybe not exactly the same way, but could we not bioengineer, you know, some kind of thing like this? I mean, would it be the real thing? Of course not. Obviously, that's why we're engineering it. But it's, uh, it, it's one of those things where you think about, like, he was thinking of stuff that people considered a pipe dream at the time. And it's one of those things like we just maybe this book taught us that, hey, maybe this is why we shouldn't do that. You know, <laughs> you know, you, you, like uh, Dr. Malcolm says, you know, you didn't even stop to think about it. If you, all you thought about was if you could do it, not whether you should do it. And I think that this book does a great job of presenting that. It's just an incredible ride that I think that anybody who likes books will enjoy. You don't have to like a certain uh, type of genre or anything to really enjoy this book. Uh, I think you're going to uh, come away from it. Feeling like you learned something, and, and you're also going to find some things that you, you didn't get out of the movie, maybe, that I think you'll, you'll you'll take home and will stick in your head just a little bit. It is, it's cliche that this is the best Crichton book for a reason, guys, because it's just that good. It really, really is. And I know everybody's always like, oh, well, you're going to pick Jurassic Park as the number one book. Of course you are, because it's like the bandwagon one. Look, guys, some things that are considered the greatest, it's because they're the greatest. They're just that good. They're amazing, you know? Uh, we, I've had this argument about rock albums all the time. Well, you're going to pick that Led Zeppelin album. Everybody picks that Led Zeppelin album. Well, because it's the greatest, you know? it just it, Sometimes it just, it just falls into that category. It's just going to happen. Uh, so if you're not just trying to be a contrarian, I think it's going to be easy for you to say this is far and away his best book in this reread up to this point. Uh, I, I don't know. I guess it all comes down to what you like. But for me, this was every bit as great as in my memory. And I am happy to say that it is still at the number one spot if I was doing that top 10 again today. I feel like Sphere actually moved up one, but I feel like Jurassic Park is going to stay right where it's at at the top of the food chain. Let's go ahead and talk about the adaptation, you guys. Finally get to talk about a good one, right? Uh, I've said this before, so I apologize if you've already heard me say it. I feel like Jurassic Park is the shining of the uh, summer blockbuster movie. What I mean by that is that it's very different in the book, but both the book and the adaptation are both great. You know, shining, not a lot like the book. Probably more like the book than this one was, but uh, it, they're both great. And the same with this. This is one of the greatest movies ever made you guys and I will stand by that forever this is a movie that I think 
I don't remember the last, maybe Star Wars was the last time I was in a movie theater and I heard people just like gasping out loud because this was a time in marketing where they didn't spoil everything in the trailers. All we saw in that trailer was a dinosaur's foot in the mud. That was all we got. We didn't see, when you first see the uh, the Brachiosaurus, that was amazing. Everyone in the theater was like gasping out loud. There were people crying and shit. I'm not even kidding about this, not hyperbole. It was a movie going experience like none I had ever seen before. And uh, I wasn't old enough to see the original Star Wars in the theaters, guys. Sorry, I wasn't born yet. The only one I saw in the theater was uh, Return of the Jedi. So I know a lot of people say Star Wars for them. This felt like the Star Wars of my generation, seeing this in the theater. So it's always gonna have, you know, that emotional attachment to it, but it's one of those things you go back and you watch it now, it's just still amazing. It really is. It's amazing how well this movie has aged. You would think, okay, they've made what, five, four, five Jurassic Park movies since then? The special effects don't look as good in any of them as it, do, it does this, but it isn't just the special effects in this. Uh, a big part of it is the music. Obviously, John Williams is a wizard. He's going to make anything better, but it just the heart and the soul in this movie, the dialogue is fantastic. The pacing is perfect. The cast is phenomenal. And I, I think it really captures the heart of what Crichton was trying to get across in that story. You know, the moral questions and things like that really does hit home with those things. And mostly that life finds a way, right? So uh, it's very, as different as it is, the heart and the soul and the DNA, if you would put it that way, is very much on the screen from the book, even if the, uh, the storytelling elements are just a little different. So talk about a couple of the differences here. Obviously the big one is John Hammond. John Hammond in the movie I feel like is, uh, you know, just like a, a grandpa who wants to, he wants all the children in the world to experience these animals. He even says it in here, his heart's in the right place in the movie. You know, he does say uh, everyone in the world deserves to experience these animals. He was, his heart was in the right, he wanted to do the right thing for humanity. In the book, he's a sleazeball, he's a monster, and he's basically like, well, over the rich kids can see him, ah, ha, ha, ha. He's very much mustache twirling sometimes. And it's, it, you see that he's very much, I, I think you can argue that scene that he's having with, with Dr. Sattler in the, in the cafe there at the end, it, you might feel like, okay, he is going a little mad. No, he's already mad scientist in the book from Go. He's very much a crackpot by this point. So that's a, that's a big difference. I actually kind of prefer him in the movie the way it was because I, I like the idea that, you know, this was his life dream and he just wanted to provide this for, you know, all the children of the world to be fascinated with. I, I like that idea. Ian Malcolm, <laughs> I think he's actually pretty well done except he just, he isn't quite the sexy rock star that Jeff Goldblum portrayed him as in that movie. I love it. I love I love what he did in that movie because I mean, who doesn't love Jeff Goldblum? I mean, he's amazing, right? It's fantastic. I mean, all the best quotes in that movie for him, but all the best quotes in this book are for me and Malcolm. You know, the the movie tried to make uh, Doctor Grant the, the the main character, and they did a great job with that. But I definitely feel like Malcolm was the main character of this book because I mean, just about all those quotes I use in the intro, there are almost all of them are Doctor Malcolm quotes because he's just he's just a He's one of those kind of guys that, like, if he talked to the news, that's that's the one they're going to be grabbing all the lines, all the quotes from, because he's just he's just that good at it. But uh, Doctor Doctor Grant, uh, I think the biggest change was it, in the movie they made it like he didn't like children. He's quite fond of children in this one. Uh, you know, he went on children, and him and Doctor Sattler are not involved in the book at all. So uh, it, it, little differences like that. But I, it's a lot of a lot of changes that I saw that I kind of I kind of liked them better in the movie. The only thing I think that the movies that I didn't like better than the book was. Uh, the, the horror stuff that they took out, you know, especially with the compies, uh, taking the compies out. There's a scene with the compies in the beginning of the book that's like, oh my, that is, that is horrifying. And it's one of those things that, you know, a lot of those scenes that were kind of horrific in the book, they actually put into the Lost World adaptation, like the waterfall, like the compies and the baby and things like that. I and mean, it's not the baby. They did just the, the, the girl on the island, I think, in Lost World. But yeah, yeah. Some of those things I wish that they would kind of left in, but I can understand why they didn't. And you know what? It, the time it came out was the highest grossing movie of all time. So Steven Spielberg is obviously going to win that argument. But uh, I just an absolute recommend, guys. I'm glad I finally get to give a huge thumbs up to this one. This is by far the best Crichton adaptation ever, even if it is very, very different. Like I said, I feel like the DNA of this story is definitely on the screen there. And you know what? It's amazing what happens when you have an amazing director like Steven Spielberg, and then you have Michael Crichton doing the screenplay, and you put those together. Who knew this was going to be an amazing, amazing event? But uh, I don't think anyone could have quite predicted what this turned out to be. Uh, just this global smash hit of a franchise. It's been going almost 30 years now. It shows no signs 
of slowing down. Jurassic World 3 comes out next year. My kids love that Camp Cretaceous that's on Netflix. And like I said, you can't go to Walmart right now without finding Jurassic Park stamped on something in that store. And I think it's just a testament to this amazing, amazing story that he started with this book. It still looks, the movie still looks and sounds amazing 28 years later. Or not the movie. How long, how old is the movie now? 20, 25? Math is hard. It's 28 years later. The book is over 30 years old. So the book is amazing. The movie is amazing, guys. And for very different reasons, I think that you could, you should, you definitely should consume both of them. So uh, that's all I got, guys. Have you read Jurassic Park? What did you think? Drop in the comments and let me know. Did you prefer the movie to the book? Did you prefer the book to the movie? Did you like both like me? There are no wrong answers. I will talk to you guys there.